Human settlements have always cropped up around sources of drinking water like lakes or rivers, but often the ideal place to build a city is where two rivers meet, and you can use the rivers to defend your people from enemies. A Gaulish tribe called the Mediomatrici built a city here, on a hill at the intersection of the Moselle and the Say, in yellow here. It was surrounded by walls built with stone and wood, in addition to its natural protection by the water. Scaling a wall and crossing a river are difficult tasks, but to do both at once was too much to ask for any invaders from the north or east until Julius Caesar conquered Gaul. The city was given a name, Divodurum Mediomagicorum, and expanded to several times its original size, in grey here, with new Roman walls to go with it, the Black Lines. The fall of the Roman Empire left Tividurum weaker than before, but the citizens were still able to repel attack after attack from invaders, until on the 7th of April, 451, during a siege by Attila the Hun, a section of the wall fell apart, and the Huns sacked the city. A few decades later, Metz was conquered by the Franks, now known as Metis, short for Dividurum Mediumatricorum. It became the capital of Austrasia, and from here the Carolingian Empire was assembled. It then became the capital of Lotharingia when Charlemagne divided up his empire between his three sons, although Lothair himself ruled from Aachen, the capital of the Carolingian Empire. In time, Metz itself became an independent republic under the Holy Roman Empire. The new walls continuously rebuilt and expanded to five and a half kilometers long, with over 70 guard towers and a moat, and it continued to fend off attacks from the Luxembourgish, the Lorrainians, the English, the Anjouans, and French, with unending success, earning nicknames that translate roughly to the Unviolated Virgin. Metz agreed to become French in 1551 in exchange for protection from Charles Quint, who after inheriting much of Europe tried conquering the rest. Charles Quint did end up ceding Metz and failed. Bullet holes in the wall at the castellated bridge across the Say are still visible from this attack. In the Napoleonic Wars, Metz successfully defended against the Sixth Coalition as well. For the longest time, crucial to the defense of Metz was the ineffectiveness of cannons against its walls. They were too thick to penetrate, and to lob cannonballs over would be both difficult and pointless. Forts were built just outside the city walls to offer even more protection. However, advancing artillery technology in the 19th century put Metz at risk of being shelled from further away. Thus, Marshal Adolphe Niel gave General Cyré de Rivière, an expert military engineer, 12 million francs to build five forts to the north and east of Metz to protect against an impending Prussian invasion. Since they were placed in a semicircle about two kilometers from the town, any force that tried to shell the city from afar would themselves be shelled by the forts. Dieu and Girardin were built on Mount St. Quentin to the northwest, together known as the St. Quentin Group. Platteville was built nearby, overlooking the village of Platteville. St. Julien was built in the hills northeast of St. julien le Metz and Kula to the southeast, all of which were to have loads of artillery positions, barracks, armories, stockhouses, and surrounded by dry moats. The buildings were all covered in thick layers of dirt, granting them both camouflage and protection from shells. Often, only grand facades facing away from the enemy show that there is a fort there at all. But the construction of the forts wasn't complete when the Franco-Prussian War began. The French army of the Rhine retreated into the walls of Metz after being defeated at the Battle of Gravelotte on August 18, 1870, and Metz was attacked without being able to rely on the new forts to repel the Prussians. Nonetheless, the walls of Metz still held for over two months until Marshal François Achille Bazin surrendered, thinking that he could work with the Prussians to march on Paris and eliminate his political opponents. The Germans were glad for the free real estate, and finished up the French forts in the following years, giving them new names. Dieu became Ostfort, Girardin became Manstein, known together as Feste Prince Frédéric Karl, Platteville became Alvensleben, Saint Julien became Mantefel, and Kulo became Guben. The Germans also built five more forts that the French had planned but had not begun building. Feste Prince August von Württemberg to the southwest, facing France, Feste von Zastrow between Mantelfeld and Guben, Hindersen to the north, and Schwerin and Voipi near Alvensleben, making a circle of nine, if you count the St. Quentin group as one. In general, the forts were built deep underground. The closest level to the surface was cover and access to the turrets, or small windows to shoot out of. Underneath were the barracks, and at the very bottom ammunition was stored, which was lifted upwards by dumbwaiters or pulleys. I will now describe each of the forts, using the French names for the originals and the German names for the newer ones for simplicity. 
The St. Quentin Group was one of the biggest forts of the era, with 72 buildings, 25,600 square meters of space. It was made by combining Dieu and Girardin and the additional Fort St. Quentin between them. Enormous constructions cover the mountain for over a kilometer, capable of housing several hundred men. The 600mm railway connecting it and the St. Quentin Group continues along the moat outside the fort northeastward, which would seem to imply Schwerin was connected as well, but for this assignment I can't go and investigate myself. Along the road and railway to the St. Quentin Group, several turrets lined the ridge, with good visibility both east and westward. Info on Schwerin is quite limited. The best information I can find under a deadline is that it was a small battery position. Upon its completion, Vwapi was visited by the German emperor, who renamed it Kamika, but locals, especially from the town of Vwapi, continued to refer to it as Le Fort de Vwapi for many years. Vwapi was another trapezoidal fort with a moat, and turrets on the north and northwest corners. In 1888, it was renovated to include a row of batteries beside Lorry Road and a munitions store outside the walls. The Vwapi online archives include excerpts of the local paper that imply the people of Vwapi did not like the German station there. One was shot in the street, another stoned, again in the street, multiple committed suicide, and one ran away, abandoning his clothes in a woman's yard. Very strange. Hinderston protected the fort and railway towards Thionville. It was a small, circular fort whose artillery pointed slightly northwest. St. Julian was also star-shaped, but more symmetrical than Platteville. It was designed to resist artillery fire by using its angled walls to brush off cannon fire, like many older French forts like Faubon. It had an ideal position that allowed it incredible offense to the north, as well as very few spots to effectively fire at it. A minefield was also created nearby, as well as extra battery positions on either side. Zastrov was a simple, small trapezoidal fort facing west. On either side were extra battery positions. Kulu was an enormous fort, once again star-shaped, with a large C-shaped facade inside that led to essentially five triangular bastions. A few bunkers stuck out of the hill around it, and later two more were added, one of which was modified to keep horses in. The garrison was decreed to be about 2,000 men. Later, the Germans also added countermines, or underground tunnels built so that if an enemy tried to dig underneath, they could be caught. At least one of these apparently led outside, which will be important later. Wurtemberg was an arrow-shaped fort, with barracks and storage underneath, and 44 cannons pointing in every direction except towards Metz. If you look closely, you can see the trees make an outline of shadows on Google Maps. By 1899, artillery technology had advanced again, and nine more forts were built about 4 kilometers from Metz. They are not the focus of this video, but keep in mind there were now two rings of forts around Metz, completely protecting the corner of Germany's border with France. Emperor Wilhelm II said of the forts, Metz and his army corps constitute a cornerstone of the military might of Germany, destined to protect the peace of Germany, even of all of Europe, a peace I will have the firm will to safeguard. In 1914, Europe erupted into several way war. <laughs> Sorry. Metz, now considered one of the most formidable strongholds in the world, never saw combat during this war, as the Allies were more focused on taking back French and Belgian lands than capturing an enemy city, so Allied troops went not much further down the Moselle than pont a mousson Any closer would be within shelling distance. The forts were used to house German troops traveling to the front. The Treaty of Versailles at the end of the war saw Alsace-Lorraine, including Metz, ceded back to France. The French army returned with thunderous applause and reoccupied the forts. The original French forts regained their original names, and Württemberg, Von Zastro, Henderson, Schwerin, and Kameke became Saint Privat, De Borde, Gambetta, De Caen, and De Roulet, respectively. The French spent the interwar period developing the Maginot Line, a series of forts and casemates defending the French border. From the perspective of Metz, you might think of this as yet another ring of protection. A few of the forts were disarmed as their weapons were deemed to be more useful elsewhere. Instead, Kulu was used as the headquarters for the Maginot Line. The Metz Frescati Air Base was also built around St. Privet, and the fort was incorporated into the base. This defense would surely be impenetrable in a one on one war against Germany, but this backfired as the Nazis decided it would be easier to avoid the Maginot Line completely by invading Luxembourg and Belgium to enter France through the north instead, which suited their imperialist vision for the Third Reich just fine. Thus, Metz once again changed hands by surrender back in Paris. Metz's forts spent most of World War II as training grounds, being now far away from the closest front line, 
and the rest of the forts were mostly disarmed, the weapons again being needed elsewhere. The Germans gave the forts their old Imperial German names again, but for my own sanity and yours I will continue to use the French names in this video. After D-Day, of course, Metz was vulnerable again. The US Third Army was bearing down on it fast, and the Nazis scrambled to rearm the forts, which they only barely had the time to do as General Eisenhower ordered the Americans to halt near Verdun to stockpile supplies. It was consensus among the Nazis that Metz was part of Germany proper, so in March 1944, Hitler declared all the forts German strongholds to be surrendered under no circumstances. This order only applied to the army, however, and many Nazi officers and civil servants fled further into the heartland, including the SS, who under the orders of General Anton Duquesne burned the ammo stocks and Nazi archives at the St. Quentin Group on August 31st. Many ancient and important Messen documents were lost. On the 2nd of September, Hitler declared the city itself a German stronghold like the forts, in anticipation of a tough siege, and shortly after, the Third Army started its assault on the Second Ring of Forts. The Americans bombed the forts several times. The biggest of these campaigns was on November 9th, when 689 bombs were dropped on them as part of a larger mission to weaken the enemy for the Third Army. The forts, covered in earth, took these relatively well, although this was largely because they were thrown from 20,000 feet in low visibility. Breaking through the second ring, Patton's third decided to take Metz through the east, from behind, essentially. The first forts of the first ring to ever fire on an army were Deroled, Gambetta, and St. Julian, who fired on the 377th 95th as they liberated Vuapi on November 15th. The next day, they began their assault on Gambetta, the fort right alongside Vuapi, alongside the 378th. The Germans fled, attempting to bring along equipment and supplies, but ultimately leaving much of it on the side of the road in panic and Gambetta was captured on the 17th. On the 18th, part of the 378th began their assault on Platteville, where the Germans were unable to retreat into the city because the bridges across the Moselle had all been dynamited. All the Germans above ground were killed or captured, but the assault ended when General Walker ordered all unnecessary forts to be simply contained rather than shelled to preserve artillery ammunition. That morning, the other part of the 378th on the other side of the Moselle, who had crossed further north, attacked St. Julian from behind, from the east. The town of St. Julian was infested with a battalion of Germans, but nonetheless by noon they had all retreated into the fort. The fort's large iron door couldn't be breached by tank destroyers, but a 155mm did the trick. The 200 soldiers trapped inside were captured the next morning. With the St. Julian fort distracted, the 377th passed around the west, and though it lost 57 men to a booby-trapped barrack, fought in the streets until the 22nd. The Germans dug in around Kula to stop the advance from the south. While one American force engaged them, the rest went around and met up with a force from the north. Back on the other side of the Moselle, another assault on Platteville and the St. Quentin group failed, although they did take a battery position between the two, and with the army already at the edge of the city, an aerial bombardment of the forts was deemed unnecessary. The southwestern prong of the attack also elected to go around the nearby St. Privet, and crossed into the city limits of Metz, becoming the first armed force to successfully force their way into Metz since Attila the Hun. Cattell, the German general in charge of Metz, was desperate for some kind of control. Entire regiments were leaving Metz under orders from Berlin. All of the forts were begging for reinforcements, and his phone lines were cut, and ended up fighting himself on the streets, and was wounded. Luckily, Metz did not see house-to-house -house fighting like Hitler had ordered. Most of the German soldiers would rather surrender than die defending a French city, and by the afternoon of the 22nd, combat had ended in the city, and the morphined up Cattell captured. Patton marched through the city to thunderous applause on the 25th, and proudly told his soldiers, Your deeds in the Battle of Metz will fill pages of history for a thousand years. But some of the forts kept on resisting. Four forts lasted into December, the St. Quentin Group in Platteville in the first ring, and Drian and Jean d'Arc in the second. The troops holed up in St. Quentin surrendered on the 6th, and Platteville did the same next morning. Jean d'Arc, somewhat ironically, resisted liberation until the 13th, about three weeks after the liberation of Metz. Questioned German commanders seemed to agree that the forts of Metz were lacking in sufficient resources, and that the Americans could have taken Metz faster than they did. But the Americans, who didn't know this, acted cautiously as well as conserving their resources for the push towards the Saar. They were also surprised that the Americans attacked Metz head-on, thinking that following the Moselle north towards Luxembourg would have been more successful at undermining the German army. Even low on resources, the forts of Metz unfortunately gave the Germans time to retreat and form a defense on the Siegfried Line. 
not liberating Metz might have been more efficient in the grand scheme of the war, which speaks to the sheer defensive capabilities of the forts, but I think most Messins would agree that it was worth the effort. No wars have been fought anywhere near Metz since World War II. For the most part, the forts were never used for their original purpose of defending Metz again. Though walking atop the forts is an excellent idea for your daily walk, it is in general forbidden to go urban spelunking inside the tunnels and underground fortifications because of noxious gases from ammunition and the bats that have made homes in some of them. The amount of litter inside the tunnels suggests that many do not follow these rules, not that I would know anything about that. Kulu was immediately used as a detention center for German citizens. The Nazis had run a program to gentrify mess with Germans, and people arrested with treason against France in the two years following the liberation. It was then put to very similar use as a prisoner of war camp for a year. Remember the countermine tunnels I mentioned earlier? Four prisoners escaped during this time, presumably through these. Then, between 1948 and 1950, it was used to house a few hundred workers hired from the poorest areas of Indochina to revitalize French industry. In 1970, Kulu was declared a historic monument, though there are progressing efforts to make the entire fort a historic monument. The next year, however, the military stopped up keeping it, and nature has been reclaiming it since. Platteville continued military use. In 1949, the French Air Force acquired it and used it as a training center for the nearby Mess Frescati Air Base until 1994, when it too was abandoned. The rules about entering the area are vague. Signs in certain areas claim it's forbidden, but it's easy to accidentally walk in through the back on a hike through the forest. As of this summer, the crumbling moat walls on the western side have protective fences along the top, and huge bundles of tied-together branches guide the trail onto a ridge and away from a particularly nasty bit, implying there's some legitimate effort to keep the trail safe. The iron bar fence beside the main gate has even been opened apart by the jaws of life to allow hikers through. At the peak of St. Quentin, a digital radio relay has been installed. As of 1994, the mountain and its forts are a site classé, or an official national heritage site. It would appear, when trekking along trails along the sides of the mountain, that some artillery positions and other installations are used by the locals as sheds or stables. A popular trail leads from the Lessey Pass along the railway, which is overgrown and buried but still clearly visible at many points, to the fort and beyond to the radio relay tower and the Bismarck Tower. Recently, ramps have been fashioned out of dirt and mud alongside this trail, and you can often see teenagers on BMX bikes flying through the air and doing stunts before you reach the fort. Advice to visitors, it is supposedly off-limits from 10pm to 6 in the morning. De Caen was renamed De Jean in 1980. It is disused and the era completely fenced off, for the most part. At the edge of Lurie le Mess, you may notice one piece of the fort between two houses, presumably connected to the rest of the fort by underground tunnels. The doors are, of course, locked. Deroulette is also disused and fenced off with two layers of gates, padlocked shut. Photos from an authorized visit show small birch trees have invaded the exterior court, making it impassable. The insides, however, seem to still be spick and span, other than rusty metallurgy. The supplemental batteries are just barely hidden from the road, but an accès interdit sign marks their presence. Gambetta is not only publicly accessible, but the iron gates are wide open in every picture the internet has. The town of Wuppi uses it for events, such as a Halloween event in 2021. St. Julian had a very strange post-war life. A zoo was nearby until 1973, at which point the monkeys fled and supposedly took over the abandoned fort. Today, a restaurant has set up shop there. It has 4 stars out of 486 reviews on Google. I should check it out next time I'm in Ness. The minefield around it has been cleared. Hopefully. Le Bard was abandoned in 1954 and is now a simple park. The facades, however, are now mostly buried to cover the doors and windows, so there is no chance of anybody getting in. Finally, the Mess Frescati airbase around St. Privet was closed down in 2012. The land was sold off and now various industries have been established there, but the fort itself is fenced off, with copious amounts of barbed wire in fact. Only on heritage days can you take guided tours. As I am saying this, this video is due in three days, so I have to end this video here if I want to finish editing it in time. So thank you for watching, and goodbye.